Base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. It is a Friday. It is January 15th, and we're in the midst of silly season that look, continues to find new ways to get silly. Uh, we've got a managerial appointment we'll talk about today. We've got an election cycle for club president that we'll talk about today that has been postponed, and I don't know what that's going to do. <laughs> Uh, we've got a bunch of MLS updates on and off the field that we'll get into. Uh, we've got a big set of matches this weekend uh, with some big rivalry matches that we'll get into as well. Tons of stuff, and we'll be talking about it with you guys this morning. You want to join the conversation, you can do it a few different ways. You can tweet at us, at Soccer Down Here. You can join us on the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. You can send us an email. You can go old school soccer down here at Gmail, whatever works for you. That's how you can communicate with us while the show's going on. You can send us funny gifts. You can make fun of uh, our, our, our crazy takes. You, you can laugh along with us, whatever, whatever you want to do. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, let's start with the news that hit just a little bit ago and it'll get one of these. Wayne Rooney is the full-time manager now at Derby County. He had been there on an interim basis. He was playing for the club. He said before that when he decides to become a manager that he would retire. If he became the full-time manager, he would retire. And I'm assuming, I don't think it was definitively said here, but um, it's a a two-and-a-half-year deal, so I'm assuming that Wayne Rooney's playing days are done. And, you know, look. Wayne Rooney, you know, however you feel about him, if he was on a club that, you know, you don't like or, or whatever, you know, you remember his time here in MLS with D.C., Wayne Rooney is, is one of the greatest players of uh, the last few generations. There's just no way around it. Uh, one of the greatest English players of all time. I don't feel like I'm stretching too far to say that. When he burst onto the scene, he was amazing. Uh, coming out of... Everton as a teenager, and I mean, when he was injured in the 2004 Euros, it kind of ruined England's chances of, of winning with that generation. You know, everybody looked at Beckham and and Gerrard and Scholes and Lampard and and what that midfield could be or should be. But the player who could have made it all actually work was Wayne Rooney as a teenager at that time. A special player and. Yeah, the end of his career got a little weird. His time here in MLS was a little weird, although it did have some incredible moments in it. The uh, the, the moment against Orlando, tracking back with the tackle and then putting in a ball uh, to Acosta on the backside, that, that's one of those that will be in the MLS highlight reel forever. It's just one of those moments. So, incredible player. Uh, no matter how you feel uh, about him or, or where he's been in his career, an incredible player, a special one. So it's, it's always a sad day when you lose those kinds of players. Now we see what he can be as a manager. And, you know, Rooney wasn't somebody that, you know, I was expecting to go into management. I didn't really know what he would do when his playing career was over. But he started talking about it, I think, honestly, before he came to D.C., if I remember correctly. He started talking about how he was looking at the next chapters in, in his time. And I, I think at one point he would have liked to have done that in the United States. Didn't work for the family, so we went back, got the opportunity at Derby to join the coaching staff. Um, didn't work. They, they made changes. Uh, they're in a really tough spot right now. They're behind on pay. And this is a move that, you know, it's a big opportunity for him, but it's also one with a ton of risk. And I'll, I'll give him credit for taking it because, man, for your first real managerial appointment to be jumping into a team that is – I think at least a few weeks behind on payroll, uh, maybe a month behind, and in the spot that they're in, that's a that's not an easy first gig. But he's he's jumping in to try to help the club. And Darby at the beginning of the season under Philippe Cosu was flat out awful. They had only won once, I want to say, in their first dozen matches. Then uh, Rooney becomes a part of this quad that they assemble together and the the numbers you know after the first two games Rooney becomes sole caretaker and now they've only got two defeats in their last nine matches if they beat Rotherham 
this weekend in the championship. They can get out of the relegation, uh, get out of the relegation zone temporarily. Rotherham is a, another team that's going to be a part of the relegation discussion and the scrap all season long. But this is an opportunity for Derby County to get out of the relegation zone. And the fan base, from what I've been able to glean since I saw the appointment this morning, basically the fan base is like, am I dreaming that you have Wayne Rooney now managing your club? And he's been appointed as such. But no, it's, it's a great opportunity for Rooney to show his managerial chops in a very, very tough situation. It's been a good start so far. How does it continue to, to run this season? And they got that opportunity this weekend to take that first step out of the relegation zone in what's been a very, very long year so far. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw the FA Cup game out because uh, it was a bunch of kids and you had some COVID issues and injury issues. But uh, before that, they had lost two of their last three. So, I mean, it started really well for Rooney, but eh, and there's the off-the-field stuff that's going to be a challenge. But they can get out of where they are. They're they're in that 22 spot right now out of 24. They're in the last spot to get relegated. They have a game in hand on Sheffield Wednesday that would happen in this Rotherham game. Um, Rotherham has, they've only played 20, so they've got games in hand. They're on 16 points. Wickham's on 15. Sheffield Wednesday's on 19 along with Derby, and Nottingham Forest is on 22. You keep going up, it's 23, it's 24. So, I mean, you could go up to QPR and, and say that they're legitimately part of the relegation scrap right now. That takes you up to 18th. So it, it's it's tough, um, but I'll give him a ton of credit for taking the job because it, it is it's got to be the best solution right now. I mean, I don't think they have the money to go out and hire anybody separate. Um, you know, he took the 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 contract with them as a player coach. I think because he wanted to to grow the club and he believed in the club. So now they need help, and he's there to help. But we'll see how he does. Um, I want to see what. His, I want to see what he says about the game, and this is always the thing that, you know, I I question when you see players go into management because, a lot of times players are shaped by who's managed them, you know, who, who really got them thinking about football and and thinking about the way they see the game, and you know, Wayne Rooney had Sir Alex Ferguson for a long time. That's a pretty good mentor when when you look at it. Um, Outside of that, you know, I mean, mm, mm, uh, and, and Ferguson, you know, I mean, tactically, you, you don't think of Sir Alex Ferguson in the ways that you think of the the Pep Guardiola's and, and the tactical developments. I, I think Sir Alex is somebody you think of a little bit more with the man management, the individual side of it, the, the off the field side of it. I want to see how Rooney sets his teams up to play. I want to see how he wants his teams to play. Does he have an idea on that? Does he, does he know where he wants to go with that yet? And and what kind of staff does he build? So we'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, But Wayne Rooney is officially now in charge of Darby County on a two and a half year deal. And he's got a lot of work to do to keep them up in the championship right now. Yeah. And there's the talk of the takeover. And there was thought that the, the takeover bid by Davincio Holdings was going to be the holdup in announcing a, a, you know, a replacement manager after the caretaker bunch. But uh, right now, that's not the case. And they say that if you tell me if you heard this before, that uh, the takeover can be completed at any time. And yes, sure. I just did use air quotes. Sure. Yeah. I always hear that. Yeah. Um, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Yes, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, so that's kind of grabbed everybody's attention early this morning. That was announced uh, about 30 minutes ago or so. Um, so many other things to get into. Let's just start with what the weekend looks like. Let's get into the matches that we'll be keeping an eye on this weekend. It, it starts today with a couple of, of huge rivalry matches. We'll talk about one first that maybe doesn't get talked about as much in this country, and it's Porto and Benfica in Portugal. Uh, One of the top rivalries there, that's at 4 o'clock. It's on Goal TV. You can watch on fanatis, F-N-T-Z dot C-O slash soccer down here if you don't have your subscription set up just yet. Porto is in second in the table. Benfica is level with them on points in third on goal differential. They're both chasing sporting 
who is four points ahead of them. So it's a big match uh, for both to try to get into that title race. Four points back. Eh. You've only played 13 games in Portugal, so there's still a long way to go. But this is an intense match always. And it's one of those rivalries that, yeah, you probably don't watch the Portuguese league on a regular basis. But this is one you can tune into and enjoy because of the intensity of it. The other one today to keep an eye on is Syria, and it's at 245. It's on ESPN Plus. Lazio and Roma, the Rome Derby. It's always a big game. It's a big game this year, too, because you've got Roma in third place. They are in the title race. Uh, Milan is leading Serie A on 40 points. Inter is on 37. Roma's next on 34, one point ahead of Juventus. Lazio's trying to get into the European spots. They're in eighth right now, but they're on 28. They're not too far back. This is one of the more intense games in the world. Now, you don't have the fans in the stands this year, so will the intensity match on the field? And that's always the question. I've been pleasantly surprised in general with rivalry matches during this pandemic where we don't have fans in the stands. They have had that intensity. If teams don't like each other, they don't like each other. The fans can elevate it. The fans can can take it in different directions. But Roma and Lazio do not like each other, period. They don't need the fans to tell them that they don't like each other. This will be a good one. Uh, Lazio is a plus 191, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal and the Composite. Roma is a plus 145. Your draw is a plus 255. And, and another example about rivalries that popped into my head as you were describing it was uh, all of, was uh, Old Firm. And you don't need fans in the stands to see the, the chippiness on the field with uh, with Rangers and Celtic. And so uh, that kind of stuff, you see Swansea and Cardiff, that one gets chippy as well. So the, the chippiness is always there, and the fans would elevate it in these cases, but it's still there out there on the pitch this season as we see these games. Yeah, we'll, we'll get deeper into the the rest of the weekend tomorrow morning on the Power Hour. But uh, Saturday in the Premier League... What jumps out to me? Leeds and Brighton at 10 o'clock. Be keeping an eye on that one. In Germany, hmm, I think a lot of people are going to be looking to see Bayern this weekend. Coming off of a loss in league. Coming off of a loss in cup. Bayern this weekend is on Sunday. They host Freiburg in early match, 930. Um, who's an eighth? You know, It's not an easy matchup for them. Uh, Red Bull Leipzig, or RB Leipzig, sorry, uh, can go into first temporarily. They go to Wolfsburg on Saturday morning. That's a 9.30 kick. Wolfsburg's in sixth. So you've got a couple of maybe sneaky good games near the top in Germany. And it starts today uh, with Leverkusen, who is in third. They go on the road to Union Berlin, who is in fifth. A- another sneaky good game. Uh, Leverkusen can pull to one point back behind Bayern. They can jump RB Leipzig temporarily. Um, Union Berlin can pull level with Dortmund in that fourth place spot and probably would actually pull ahead of them on goal differential. So the rivalries are going to be good this weekend, but also you've got some top of the table kinds of matches around the leagues as well. Yeah, uh, FCUB at home is a plus 230. Bayer Leverkusen on the road is a plus 125. And your draw is basically a plus 245. Pretty much anywhere from plus 245 to plus 250. And we know on Sunday, the one a lot of people in this country will be jumping on, Liverpool and Manchester United. That's at Anfield at 1130 on Sunday. Um, mentioned the, the Bayern Freiburg game. That's at 930 on Sunday. So you've got a doubleheader right there. You've got Napoli and Fiorentina really early at 6.30 on Sunday. Uh, You've got Inter and Juve at 2.45. So there's a quadruple header for you that can take you up to about 5 o'clock, and that'll just get you ready for uh, Bonfield and Boca Juniors in the Copa (laughs) Diego Armando Maradona final in the evening. So you're good to go. You're, You're set on Sunday with games nonstop. So basically what you're telling me is is that I need to have all of my devices charged in multiple cars as I'm leaving Florida and heading back to Office HD. I need to have every device 
accessible and possible and make sure that I'm out of the national forest so I can have a signal to listen to all this stuff as I drive back on, on a Sunday, right? Yeah, and make sure you're not driving and make sure you don't get uh, punched in the face by the boss for, for listening to all these games. Well, actually, you know, uh, she doesn't mind on the drive home because she can nap like nobody's business. She can go out like that. And honestly, it's like if she's just like uh, Trooper, the dog. And the, sec- the second you hit the freeway and the noise is constant, she's out. And so I can pretty much have wh- whatever I like. But remember, we'd be heading back in two cars once we hit the halfway point because uh, the the new addition to the family oh, well, will be. Uh, well, so I'll have I'll have in, in the Nissan Murano that's being added to the family. I'll have my Sirius XM in her in, in in my car. She'll have what's going on in her car, so I can listen to it all day long. No, oh, very nice. Um, also, Sunday uh, game that we've got to talk about a little bit here: Barcelona hosting Athletic Bilbao in the Spanish Super Cup final. Everybody thought because the whole event was structured to get Barcelona and Real Madrid in the final. Uh, Barcelona held up their end of the bargain, took penalties to do it, but they did it. Real Madrid did not hold up their end of the bargain. Uh, They looked awful in the first half. Uh, They end up losing to Athletic 2-1 in the semifinal. Uh, Raul Garcia scored both goals for Bilbao. Um, Benzema pulled one back for Real Madrid. It's just, there's way too many times this year that Real Madrid does not look like Real Madrid. It's it's just they look ordinary far too often, and this was another time they they look look, they look great in the second half as they're chasing a game, but you can't put yourself in that spot over and over and over and over again. So Real Madrid does not have a chance to win the Super Cup in Spain. Barcelona does, and Barcelona needs whatever good news they can find because now, after a meeting with the club and the Catalan government the presidential elections that were going to be held on January 24th, and they have to be held in person, and we're still dealing with a pandemic, they're going to have to be postponed. What that does for Barcelona's business, I have no idea. Yeah. Because the candidates have have said that, I think they're meeting with uh, Carlos Tusquets, who's kind of the overseer right now with this, Um, temporary management board. I believe Laporta already said, like, I don't think the, that they can do anything. I don't think they can like make signings. I don't think they can make any financial moves right now. So if it gets postponed, I mean, the transfer window is only open for a certain period of time. I don't think it's going to be held before the windows over. So a player like Eric Garcia, for example, you know, the reports were that they have a deal in place to sign him on a pre-contract. They were hoping that maybe they could get a deal done to bring him in now, or at least before the end of the window, but that doesn't look likely. So it just is what it what it's going to be for Barcelona right now, because I don't see any way they can make changes in this month without a president being elected. So then let me ask you this, with the, the, the Lionel Messi question as part of this discussion, what do you, where do you think this impacts... The, the messy thoughts about having to, you know, nothing going on, so you can't do anything. It know? doesn't change anything. He already said that he wasn't going to do anything until there was a president, and I, he's honestly said that he's not going to do anything until the end of the year. So, no, it doesn't change anything. I mean, are people going to be out there talking on his behalf? Yeah, it's always possible. I mean, he's not stupid, and you got to protect yourself. But, you know... I think everybody really does underestimate the emotional pull of the club to Lionel Messi. And it's hard for us to quantify because, you know, we're not used to seeing that sort of thing in this country. Uh, Messi and Barcelona is a pretty unique relationship. And I think what he's made clear over the last season, um, since everything really fell apart in the summer, is that his issues were not with Barcelona as an institution. His issues were with the, the president, Bartomeu, who lied to him over and over again. And, you know, he didn't trust him. Not that he didn't trust the club. He didn't trust that person. And that person right. is not there anymore. So I think he's willing to give whoever's elected, whenever they're elected, an opportunity. And I don't think he's going to do anything between now and then. Um, will he kind of know what the market is? 
Yeah, I would assume that his his father, who's you know his agent and does a lot of this business for him, is going to know. You know, even if it's not on paper, he's going to know. All right, this is what PSG can pay. This is what they can do. This is what they're going to offer. This is what Manchester City could offer. And we'll, we'll sit down and make all the decisions afterwards. But I don't see him now saying, oh, well, now I'm going to go leave and I'm going to sign a pre-contract. Like, no, I don't think that changes. See, I think he's made that clear. Messi's a pretty honorable guy. I don't think he's going to go back on his word. Well, I mean, and considering what was discussed at the beginning of, of all of this, where he didn't want to take Barcelona to court, he didn't want to do anything through a legal means because of what the club means to him. And so... Knowing that, that was why I still wanted to ask the question because of the transfer window being what the transfer window was. Even though I know what his emotions are, where the where the club is concerned, I still wanted to to introduce that just as a thought. Yeah, but I think his emotions towards the club are going to d- rule everything here. He's going to give them every opportunity to keep him. Maybe they can't. Maybe maybe they they really just can't. Um, maybe PSG or, or Manchester City make an offer financially that he can't say no to. And if that's the case, that happens. Look, that, that's, that's business. But I think he wants to stay. I think his heart wants him to stay. I think he wants to stay for his family. Will he? We'll just have to wait and see what the offers are. But I would think it's more likely that he stays. I really do. Um, even with this, I don't think this changes anything. I think it just changes the the timing of when those conversations can really start with a new president. And legitimately at the beginning of all of this, uh, I thought that he was gone. I thought he was heading to Manchester city. I thought that he would be heading to PSG, but the, the more that this has proce- processed, if that's a word proceeded, gone forward, I still think now I've changed my mind. I think that he stays and it's just looking at how the situation has evolved over time. I've gone from he's going unless it's an offer that he can't refuse, to staying because of what the club means to him. So I've completely flipped on this. Well, it's because it's not about it's not about the club. It's about the person who was there lied to him. And I think, yes, if Bartomeu had not been ousted as president and still had an opportunity to lie to him and make life difficult for him, that he might have tried to leave uh, sooner. He might have tried to leave in this window. If Bartomeu had stayed through March, which is when the elections were going to be held, when his term was up, then, yeah, maybe we're having a different conversation. But things have changed. And I think Messi's made that clear in his comments. You know, he's he's pretty open. I mean, he didn't really talk much before. And now, I mean, it's not like he's talking a ton, but he's very clear in what he's saying. I mean, given the interviews that he, he's given over the last couple of years, pretty in-depth, or the last couple of months, He's, I think, laying it out pretty clearly what he wants, and we'll see if it, you know, goes down for him. All right, let's get into silly season with an MLS twist first, and uh, we will work backwards. Um, Andres Ibarguen is linked by ESPN in Mexico to Minnesota United. There is a hang up on this. Uh, he is paid designated player kinds of wages at Club America right now. Um, It was announced before CONCACAF Champions League that they were going to move on from him this season. And if he's going to go to Minnesota, he's got to sign for less than that because they don't have a DP spot open, according to ESPN in Mexico. So he'd have to lower his salary cost. The the club wants to get things done before the end of January. Club America does. Um, It's also the window, but he's not going to be there this season unless something dramatically changes in that relationship. Roger Martinez is in the same boat, but it looks like Martinez is going to go uh, to a Colombian club. The Bargwin is linked to Minnesota. We'll see if they can find a way to get it done. They are still trying to get Luis Amaria back. Um, that deal looks like it is still up in the air. He is a Velez Sarsfield player, but he was linked to uh, Liga de Quito earlier in the week. Sounded like it was done, but hasn't really progressed so maybe they are still in play and local reports in minnesota have said they're still in play so if you don't get amaria you might get ibarguin and maybe you make a decision between the two depending on the dollar figures that are there amaria was good for them uh injured late so he didn't help them at the end Uh, ibarguin a little bit older uh he's he's been very good for club america can he continue to do it 
if I'm picking between the two, it's Amaria, but that might not be a, a possibility for them. Um, other moves. Portland is linked to a couple. The, the easier one is a link, again, from ESPN in Mexico, that they're going to sign Mexican right back uh, Jose Carlos Van Ranken from Chivas on a one-year loan. Okay, no, no huge deal there. Smart piece of business, 27-year-old right back. You bring him in. Okay, you've got cover it right back, a loan deal. Cool. The crazy move that Portland has been linked to that doesn't make any sense whatsoever is a, a link out of Turkey, and, and the Turkish club Galatasaray has talked about this. Uh, Radamel Falcao could be going to the Portland Timbers. Galatasaray is willing to facilitate the departure. This has been reported all over South America. Um, they want to get this done as quickly as possible. Will Falcao accept the contract that was offered to him by MLS? Because it sounds like it's at that stage. Uh, Varsky Sports has left it there so far. Now, there was a tweet exchange last night uh, with Hercules Gomez of, of ESPN. I think he did the eyes emoji with a link to the story. And Merritt Paulson, who's the owner of the Portland Timbers, just responded with the eyes emoji. That was it. So does that mean, yes, this is there something going on? Or... Hey, I'm just playing along, <laughs> or what? Who knows? We're trying to figure out emojis and what they mean. Um, it makes no sense because they were reportedly bringing back Mora uh, on a permanent from Pumas. They've got uh, Jeremy Abobasi up top, but it sounds like maybe they're not convinced that he is the guy. There's been talk that he would be loaned out. Um, they've got Nish Goda, who is injured and probably going to be out for the year. Falcao. I don't think he's going to play in this league for five years, but could he give you a year or two? Potentially. Uh, Portland just didn't seem to fit. You know, Miami had chased him for a while, and I, I've seen some people speculate that it's not Portland, it's Miami who's trying to get him, but they've got Gonzalo Higuain, so does that fit? I don't know. Like, I, I, this one makes no sense to me. When it came up, it just, I didn't get it, and I still don't get it, and, and we'll see if they get it done. It, It'd be a very big shift in the way that Portland has generally built their roster. Um, it would make it feel a little bit like it's a win-now kind of move. Yeah. And can they pull it off? We'll have to wait and see. That was what I was thinking. As you were talking it through, it seemed like needs go to cover, a veteran move, and win-now. So it seemed like it was choice D, all of the above for me, as you were talking through what, you know, if Falcao were to happen then uh, uh, that to me is what it seemed like. It's like uh, you're bringing a veteran for a year or two, cover for Nish Gota, and then, you know, win now. So that's what it seemed like. It, it, as you were piecing it together, that's what it came across to me as. Yeah, it feels like a very win now move. So we'll, we'll see if they can pull that off. Uh, stay tuned on that. And the one that everybody's asking about because it affects a club that you have railed on many, many times, uh, Swansea <laughs> City. <laughs> who I thought you liked, but man, you talk so much trash about this team, who's doing really well this season. They are reportedly, according to Mike McGrath of The Telegraph, in talks to sign Seattle Sounders uh, forward slash winger Jordan Morris mm -hmm. on a six-month loan. What do you think? Intriguing. Uh, Swansea right now, if memory serves, is 10th in the championship in offense, goal score. So bringing in someone like Jordan Morris and Modaflow and Colonel, if you're listening, whenever you're listening, go ahead and, and add your comments into this as well. They need goal scoring help. I think that Jordan Morris can be a part of that because you're looking at Jamal Love, you're looking at Jamal Lowe, you're looking at Andre Ayew. You need help in that regard. So bringing in Jordan Morris could do that. The other aspect of this, if it's a six month loan right now, you mentioned that Swansea is second in the championship table. That's an automatic promotion spot. Could this be something longer if Swansea is promoted to where Jordan Morris ends up playing for a Premier League side next year if things continue to proceed in that manner? So uh, intrigued, would love to see it. It would give me something else to talk about every week on Normandy Road if uh, Jordan Morris is a, a part of what's going on. But once again, there's that outside chance that he could be a part of a Premier League side next year as well. Nobody said anything about it being more than a six-month loan, John. You're, you're adding a whole lot of speculation to that. 
I'm thinking ahead. I'm thinking that this could be the a, this could be a possibility. That's I wasn't saying that this was a definite. I said it was a possibility that if this happened, then you get the the uh, the payment for being a part of the Premier League. It gives you more operating revenue. You could possibly keep Jordan Morris for longer than that six month and make an enticing make an enticing bid to keep him if that was in fact the case and if you were impressed with what you saw in the six month period. So how is your uh... Swansea team lining up. I'm I'm looking back and I'm seeing three five two. Is that consistent? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I mean, from what I've seen from Steve Cooper, that's pretty much what has stuck in my head this year. That's, that's but what once I'm again, it's it's just the the you know uh, more goals in the back of the net, please. I mean, there's only so many times that a one nil can get well, you a win. Well, well, well. There, there's a reason I'm asking because if they're playing three five two as their base structure, right? Um, and, and Colonel says they're talking to a lot of strikers. Uh, all the reports are to be a loan, a short loan. So let's let's not jump any further than that. Um, Jordan Morris has played his best out wide in, mm-hmm. in an attacking role out wide, like a wide forward, not a winger in a true sense, not an English right. winger by any stretch. You don't right. have that in the system. So he would be playing nope. as a number nine or as a second forward running off of the nine, and I'd assume it'd be the latter because he's not really a true number nine. Um, Colonel right. says they switch between three in the back and four in the back. But is it two up top traditionally, Colonel? That's that's where I'm at. Um, that's what I'm wondering. So I I don't like Morris as much as a as a striker. I think where he plays in Seattle off to the side of Raul Rui Diaz is the best fit. And I think that's where he has done really well. Modiflo says that, you know, Morris isn't actually a nine, but he would fit into the Jamal Lowe IU role where the forwards kind of roam. And if, if, if that's the case, then that could work. I'd like to see him in that. I just, I don't know how it works. Um, in Seattle, when he's played up top as a, as a forward, I haven't liked him as much when he's right. played out wide where he can drive at goal from a wide position, I think he's at his best. Agree. So if you're, it just depends on how you're set up and how you see him. I, I'm, I'm curious about it. I'm, I'm intrigued by it. We'll see you know, what they end up doing. Uh, the, the chatter about Morris going to Europe um, has built for a while now, so I could absolutely see that there's something to it. A six-month loan? Well, there's a couple things that jump to mind. I mean... Okay, six month loans, no big deal. But you know, would Seattle want to lose him for the first half of the season? But right. if the season's going to start later, then how much are you actually going to lose? So, and that's that's a little worrisome. But we have to wait and see. Um, yeah. Colonel says it'd be tough to get playing time against IU and Low, and that's what I'm wondering. Like, if you say that the strikers aren't very good, Modiflo saying that the strikers, you know, you need strikers, but these two guys, are you going to beat them out? I don't know. I could see, I could see it. Uh, I mean, IU with age and injuries, I could see an opening there. Okay. Uh, just this with past history. So I could see him challenging in the, for the IU role. I mean, Jamal Lowe was brought in for, for that, you know, for that reason to put, you know, to put balls in the back of the net. So uh, like I said, intriguing. I like you uh, agree that Morris is best when he's out wide, but if he's going to be, you know, if he's going to be a roamer, I, w- I want to see it. I'd love to see it. I will end up buying the Jordan Morris Swansea gear. Trust me, I, I will do that. You'll see it on the show for those watching on the Twitch pitch. I will be all in on Jordan Morris if he ends up at Swansea City. That is no surprise. I'm I'm a little more skeptical about it. I just if he's not going in and he's not going to go in and play. Like, if he's yeah. going in to compete for time on, on a six-month loan, hmm, like, really? Is that, is that going to work? Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, it would be counterproductive because then why would you make the investment if you're going to compete instead of going to make the investment so you can play? It's two different who, things. Who, who's making the investment? What are you talking about? No, I'm saying that if, if it's a loan, obviously there's, there's the loan fee attached to it from, Maybe, from Swansea's perspective. Potentially. But no, no, no you're, you're getting into a Swansea thing that you're, I, I thoroughly disagree. This is why you do a loan if he's going in to compete. 
If you don't know if he's going to come in and start, yeah, you absolutely do a loan. And maybe there's a purchase option, who knows? But, yeah, you do a loan if you're not sure. And and I don't think you can be sure. So from the Swansea perspective, 100%. I'm talking from his perspective. I'm talking from Seattle's perspective. Mm-hmm. Like, why would you send him over there if he's, you know, going to be making up numbers on the squad or coming off the bench unless he is pushing for the move? True. And if he is, then then that's fine. And and you, you try to do right by him because, look, he chose you. He he could have went to Werder Bremen a, as a kid, and he didn't. And he signed a deal with you, and he's delivered, and he's won multiple titles. So, it, it, you know, hometown kid, the, the family's been involved with the club uh, from day one in MLS. So if, if he decides this is the move I want to make for my career, you facilitate it. But from the Swansea side, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jason Nix asked about have we heard he wants to go to Europe. He's been talking about it a lot here lately. Um, he's been asked about it a lot, and he's answered the questions. He chose not to go to Europe at the very beginning of his career. He wanted to stay in Seattle. Again, hometown kid. Family's been involved with the club. His dad's the, the team doctor. All makes sense. All, all makes sense. Um, I'm wondering if at his age now, and he's not that old, but he's like, this could be an opportunity for me to test myself over there. I've done everything I can do here. There's nothing else for me to prove. Let me go now while I'm at a point where I can still have five, six years over there if I do well. And maybe this is him dipping his toe in the water, and we wait and see. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 it makes sense for Swansea if you're getting him on a loan and from hearing what everybody's saying about their situation, he would be coming in to play in a crowded schedule. He'd be coming in to compete for time. He wouldn't be just handed minutes. You get him on a loan. That makes sense. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, for Seattle, I'm, I'm a, I'm, the only thing I'm, I keep going back to with Seattle is, you know, is it their first choice to do it? No, but it's Jordan Morris who's going to be treated a little bit differently by the Sounders than, you know, a player who's been there for a year. You know, right. if it was somebody who'd been there for a year and wanted to go on loan like this just because, nah, you're probably going to say no. If it's Jordan Morris saying it, yeah, you're going to try to do right by him. So I, I, I get that. Uh, let's get into some other MLS stuff. Uh, there was an update from Stephen Goff on the DC United coaching search. And now they've pivoted to Europe um, after talking to every assistant in MLS and almost getting deals done and then falling apart at the last minute. Now they're going back to the international candidates. Who, who created this flowchart and why does it make no sense? But anyway... Uh, now they have at least four candidates, according to Stephen Goff, and two of them he had names for, uh, Bur- former Birmingham City manager Pep Clote, Clote and Belgium-based Hernan Losada. Losada is 38 years old, Argentine, coaches first division Beerschot, who is probably atop D.C. United's list according to people who talk to Stephen Goff. Um, he's got a lot of people. He's, he's got a lot of people who talk to him. Mm-hmm. Um, Losada played for the club in Belgium, spent most of his playing career in Belgium, transitioned into coaching in 2018 as an assistant, uh, promoted to the head coach 10 matches into the 2019-20 season, got them promoted from the second division last year, currently seventh in the 18-team league with a 9-8-3 and three record, so still very young. Um, Clote is a 43 year old Spaniard, another you know, pretty young coach. Uh, he's coached since 2001 though. Uh, most recently he's been an assistant for Swansea city, um, for Leeds in the championship head coach of third flight, Oxford United for seven months in 2017, 18 and assistant for Birmingham city. Um, while they were in the championship, uh, before handling the top job in 2019, 20, 10 game winless streak last summer, he stepped down. Um, according to, to Goff, to kind of recap DC United's coaching situation, they have spoken to more than 25 potential candidates. They've engaged in negotiations with Chris Armas and then Gonzalo Pineda. They were unable to reach a contract agreement with both of them. Armas is now in Toronto. Pineda is probably going to stay in Seattle. Early in the search, according to Goff sources, United wanted to hire somebody familiar with MLS or U.S. soccer. As it's dragged on, now they've started to look at foreign coaches. 
If you've talked to, and this is a philosophical question, if you've talked to two dozen people and you're you're the last one on the board, right? In MLS right now. You're the last one looking. Who's, no. So who's, who, who else is left? Miami. Oh, Miami, okay. So then if you're they, one they of the last ones on the board. not hired Phil Neville yet. And I know there, there's a question about an update there. There isn't one, so waiting to see. The FA okay. has not announced that he's leaving the England women's job, which he will after the Olympics. Already that was agreed to. But the FA was supposed to announce, according to reports, that he was leaving earlier. That has not been announced yet, so I don't know what's going on. My, my question in all of this is, is that if you've talked to all of these people and you still haven't come up with a solution, and this could be completely and totally case by case and person by person that something else different sets them off as to why. But what what is taking so long? What is what's the trigger in all of these discussions for these coaches to sit there and say no? To where you're now looking back overseas oh, after having oh, talked to oh, oh, sure. We don't know that the coaches said no. Okay. Well, we don't. We we don't. We, no, I know. We know because no, no one publicly has said you know no. We, we don't know because we don't know how the negotiations went. We know that they negotiated. We know a contract was not reached. The coach, in this case, Armas or Pineda, might have asked for too much money, might have asked for too much money for their staff, might not have gotten something they wanted. We don't know that. So they might have said, the coach might have said no for that. The club might have said no because the ask was too big. We don't know on that. So I, I, I'm just reluctant to say they started negotiating and then the coach just said no and walked away. We don't know right. how that went down exactly. So it's just when all of this is over and the information starts to, if it, if the information comes out, I, I would just like to know where in these cases, was it the team that was asking too much? Was the team, you know, was there a difference in philosophy with what the, the particular individual wanted versus what the club was offering. And so it, it's intriguing to me on a bunch of different levels as to why they haven't had an agreement yet with an individual. So for me, I would just like to know when all of this search is over, why it took so long and who they, you know, who they finally agreed to. I just have, I just have a, you know, I would have thought that for a job like DC United, that Perhaps it would have taken a lot less time than it has taken. I would just like to know when all this is over, what took so long? I mean, we know what took so long. Is I doubt, I doubt, seriously, I'm not going to get that answer, but it's just, it's just a question that I have. It's like, okay, you've been talking to all of these individuals, and nothing has happened yet. So, so I'm just, uh, the why is what's stuck in my head. Yeah, but I mean... Look, you interview a lot of people. Um, this feels like maybe a little bit more than, than normal, but you interview a lot of people. You get down to a couple of deals uh, that didn't get done, and, and we don't know why. We don't know if it's the, the, the individual or the club that walked away from the table at that point, and, and we won't get an answer to that. Um, I'm more concerned about what they're looking at at this point because, yeah. you know, Chris Armas – We'll leave out the, the Red Bull side of things, which is why it would have never been truly embraced. And that was something they should have known and shouldn't have even gone down the road. But you were talking about somebody with experience and you were talking about somebody that, you know, Jesse Marsh is going to vouch for. And, and he did in interviews about uh, the hire in Toronto. Um, Jesse Marsh, incredibly well respected right now. So, you know, you're talking about somebody who has experience. Gonzalo Pineda doesn't have that. You know, Ezra Hendrickson, Pat Noonan doesn't have that. Jill Ellis doesn't have that at the club level. There, there, there was no experience at the club level. Then you're talking to assistants in, in Europe at that time. Borrell doesn't have, you know, management experience at the club level as a first team manager. You know, at least now you've got somebody in Losada who, who has a little bit of experience, but it's seriously a little bit. Yeah. I mean, he he was an assistant when he was hired on May 25th, 2018. Three months into that, he signed a five-year contract with the team. I, I want to get his total amount of games he's managed 
because it's it's not many, but it's more than a lot of the people they've talked to. And, and that's what I just, I don't, I don't understand what direction they're going here. I, I, I don't get it because of looking at assistants and taking that leap of faith that they're going to turn into a top manager. One, you need to start developing your own assistants that you can then promote if you're going to go down that road, if that's what you're going to do. Um, develop them at Loudoun United, develop them in the academy, move them up the chain. Okay, that didn't happen. Uh, he's got 41 games of experience in Belgium in the second division and now uh, about 20 or so in the first division. And he won second division title in Belgium. And, you know, we're talking about a manager here in Atlanta who won a second division title in Argentina with Argentinos Juniors. But then he had two, two and a half, but two really good full seasons in the Argentine first division. This guy's got half a season in the Belgian first division. And he's taken a club that got promoted and done well. So that, that's definitely good. Yeah. But, you know, even as an assistant, you're talking about somebody who started as an assistant in July of 2018. Yeah. You know, um, there's very limited experience here. He, uh, Lasada, a little bit more on him. He developed at Independiente. That's where he broke through uh, as a pro. Played uh, about 50 games there. Um, bounced around a little bit. He went to Universidad de Chile for a minute. Then went to Belgium. He did play for Anderlecht for a, a little while. Played for Herenveen in the Netherlands on loan from Anderlecht. But most of his career um, has been at, at Beerschot. And they've got a bunch of different names. I think maybe they've had a bunch of, of changes to their club as they've moved things around. It's a little confusing because I think he's played for three different variations of, of this club's name. Um, but that's where he stuck, and he stayed after he retired and joined the coaching staff. So uh, we'll have to see. I, I, you know, I can't tell you anything about how he, how he manages. Um, there's really no way to know that, coming mostly from the second division in, in Belgium. We don't really have access to that. So yeah. uh, you know, I, I think Burned asked a good question in, in the chat. You know, if you're looking at these kinds of folks, if you're looking at assistants, you're looking at assistants internationally, why has Steve Chirondolo's name not come up at this point? Yeah. I, I don't understand that. Um, you know, maybe maybe Losada has a, a better understanding of what he wants to do in building a team. Maybe he just interviewed really well. I don't know, but I don't even know if Chirondolo has been interviewed. And, and it feels like a giant duh that you're mm-hmm. at least going to talk to him because he's made it clear that he, he's ready, he wants to work, you know, as a manager, and you would have the opportunity to bring a, a U.S. men's national team legend in, and just from a just from a selling it perspective, I mean, what's going to be easier selling uh, a guy who should be in the Hall of Fame, um, World Cup experience with the United States, uh, you know, one of the best right backs this country's ever produced, or selling somebody who has you know worked in the the second division in Belgium primarily yeah. and you know, is still very young and, and still finding his way as a manager. Um, I would go Chirondolo uh, unless, and we see it happen from time to time. Look, you know, we're not in the interview room. We don't know. Maybe he has just, Losada has won everybody over. I don't know. Uh, but it seems like he's the favorite at this point. There's at least a couple of other international candidates that Stephen Goff did not have names on. So stay tuned there. This Days of our lives coaching search that they were going on with DC United. Um, man, it is absurd. I'd like to know how many Zoom minutes they have used on all of this because it's just getting to be a little ridiculous. But that's the latest on DC. There's a question um, from Sam Williamson about how do we feel about Armas at Toronto? Is he a step up or a step down? I think he has to be looked at as a step down from Vanny just because what Vanny did versus what Armas has done as a manager, there's no real comparison. But Armas is still young in the job, and I, I think it was very smart for uh, Toronto to make sure that Jesse Marsh was talking to folks about Chris Armas. Um, Jesse Marsh is is one of the you know most respected names in American coaching circles right now with, with what he's doing at Salzburg. And uh, he 
talked about how he, he said he was my right hand man. He was a big part of everything we did there from tactics to training preparation to individual relationships with guys. I think we both grew a lot in our time with the New York Red Bulls and our expertise and our idea in football. He'll come with an idea with details and mentality and understanding of what's necessary to compete and succeed in this league. Now, I think what Marsh said that is really important here is obviously he has to win championships there, and that's the pressure of being at a place like Toronto. But the resources, the tools, the commitment from the organization is at a different level than anywhere other than here in Austria and Leipzig that I've been. In New York, we had a lot of success, but we didn't have all the resources that Toronto has and the commitment. little surprised that Jesse Marsh would... uh, kick New York um, while he's still yeah. in the Red Bull organization like that. That was a, a little surprising, but it's true. I mean, Toronto, mm-hmm. you're going to be expected to win trophies straight away. New York, you didn't have all the resources. You were expected to develop young players. It's a different job. I, I think Armas can do well. I don't know what it looks like yet, and I don't know how he'll be embraced by the fan base. That was my biggest question It's just – it's such a difference going from Vanny, who won a treble and had success, got to two other finals, to Chris Armas, who did lift a supporter shield that was you know, halfway, or maybe even more than halfway, won by Jesse Marsh while Armas was on the staff, and then didn't have a ton of success. But Marsh is right in saying they didn't have the resources to truly compete. Did Armas get it wrong in New York while he was there? You know, did he just not have a good enough team? Did he do the best he could with what he had to work with? I think we'll see a little bit more over time with Gerhard Struber, and we'll see a little bit more with Chris Armas in Toronto answers to those questions. Yeah, and where Armas is concerned, you know, where, where, where you're with Red Bulls, you're developing talent, now you're going into a situation with is aging a Good word to use here, aging talent or age. Uh, but just because of you're talking about Bradley and Altador and Omar Gonzalez and folks and uh, Pasuelo in his late, uh, late 20s, but I mean specifically folks like Altador and Bradley who are on the back nine of their playing careers. Altador is 31. I, he is. I look at the, I, look, I know, but I look at, I look at the injuries right. and I look at everything else. So when you have all this veteran talent, you know, how, how are you going to be managing it? How much of the, the folks from, uh, you know, TFC two are, are going to be a part of this discussion. You, you have these folks that are on the back nines of their careers. That to me is a question about managing all of that, that talent there as well. There's the discussion about AO Akinola who's being courted. Do you take that deal, uh, as a part of things right now in the current landscape? So it, it's a different thing where Armist is having to deal with veterans as opposed to where he was with Red Bulls. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes with him. All right. I'm, I'm not going to let the Josie Altador slander continue because you started okay. it. And now Jason Nix is rolling down that road. Um, I do think he's past his prime, Jason. I, I totally agree. But uh, he absolutely has had a prime. Um, 42 goals for the national team. Mm-hmm. And um, there's not many people who can say that. <laughs> there, no, when he's when he's healthy, I, I'm going to stipulate when he is healthy. Josie Altador is a beast, no question, absolutely none. But can you count on him for a full season and a full grind with his injury history? No, I totally agree. I, I'm I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing that. Um, he's still 31. You, you've got to see when. Uh, if he can stay healthy, he absolutely deserves another opportunity to stay healthy. I mean, let's look at what he's done in Toronto. Because Jason said, I'm not sure when his prime was. And we'll, we'll figure that out here in a second. Um, in Toronto, year one, 13 goals in 25 games in 2015. Uh, year two, 10 goals in 23 games. 2017, when they did the treble, 15 goals in, in 27 games um, in the league. That's that's pretty massive. Um, mm-hmm. In 2018, seven goals in 13 games. That's where the injuries really started to become an issue again. Uh, 2019, I mean, he had 11 goals in 22 games. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, this year, 
tons of issues, and I don't know if we truly know every bit of it. Uh, you know, he stayed in Florida during the the pandemic, joined the team late, only played in thirteen games, had a ton of injury issues, only two goals. Did the the nature of this year was it harder for him with his history with with hamstring and and quad kind of injuries to to stay fit? I could see that. Uh, we'll see what next year will be because it might not be normal either, but maybe it'll at least be normal from a timing perspective. In terms of his prime, to me, it was, you know, and, and I think he made a a mistake, although the money was too good at the time to say no, and going to Villarreal because he, he didn't really play there, but I'd say his prime was probably 2009, 2008, through 14. Um, but as we just went through the Toronto years, he's had other years that have been great. Uh, in the area of Vizy with Azed, I mean, 16 goals in 34 games in, in 11-12, 23 goals in 33 games in, in 12-13. That's probably when he was at his best. He, he didn't do well at Sunderland. There were a lot of people who didn't do well at Sunderland. He's not yeah. the only one. Um, you know, national team stuff, uh, 2009, he had six goals in 17 games, and, and you think about the, the breakout in the Confederations Cup. Uh, 2013, he had eight goals in 14 games. 2015, he had six goals in 13 games. Six more goals in 2016. You now, he's, he's developed. He didn't do well at Hull again. Not many people are doing well at Hull either. Um, I think a lot of people hold his time in England against him because it's what most people pay attention to. But he was at Sunderland and Hull in those times. Yeah. You know, not really at the, uh, the, the heavyweights. No. Um, and he didn't do well, no. But he did amazingly well in the Air Divisie, and he's done very, very well in MLS, uh, first as a kid with the Red Bulls and then back with Toronto. Uh, inconsistent with the national team is a little unfair, Abby. I think that's a little harsh. Uh, 42 goals in 115 games is, I believe, third all time. I'm going to double check that. Um, I think he is third all time. Give me this. Uh, goals. Yes. Third, uh, eight goals ahead of Eric Winalda. He's 15 goals behind Dempsey and Donovan who are our level and ratio of goals to games played. He's second behind Dempsey. So no, nah, I, I, I think I think Josie is maybe, I mean, because Dempsey and Donovan are not pure strikers. I think Josie's the best complete number nine that the national team ha- has had in the modern era. Uh, Winalda and McBride w- would fight you on that, and they should. Uh, but Josie's produced more. He's scored more. He scored at a better rate than both of them. And I think maybe the reason why there's a bit of a knock on him and, and, look, you guys are not the only ones who have it. Uh, a lot of people knock on, on Josie for different things. I think it's because we saw so many flashes of brilliance as a kid at the Red Bulls, and then he made the move to Villarreal, and then the Confederations Cup in 2009. Um, you know, he had a good World Cup in 2010. Um, he, he showed so much where it's like, oh, my goodness, he's not just going to be – the best striker the U.S. has ever had, but he's going to be one of the best strikers in the world. And he didn't get there. And I think injuries probably prevented him from that, but he's the, I think he's the best true number nine that this country's ever produced. I'll I'll put him ahead of McBride because I, McBride is somebody that I'm a huge fan of. And I've always been a huge fan of, I, I think Josie at his best versus McBride at his best. Josie's unplayable at times at his best. Mm-hmm. Because of that combination of speed and size and, and you know, good feet, you know, good passer, good hold-up play, and he could just blow by you. Uh, Winalda, yeah, Winalda, I agree, Burn, more of a poacher. A little bit different kind of, of number nine. Absolutely a place for it, but maybe not. He doesn't translate maybe as much to the modern day. McBride would, because McBride could be that number nine and incredible in the air. Josie was the, the best overall. Um, I'm trying. Colonel saying he didn't have a good 2010 World Cup. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember him stinking up the joint. No, that's 2014, Colonel. Colonel, 2014 is when he pulled a hamstring in match one. Different tournament. 
Uh, and yeah, that's on Klinsman for not having Landon Donovan there to back him up. But you know, that's a whole other mm-hmm. topic that we're not going to go down because I don't have much of a voice to <laughs> yell about Jurgen Klinsman this morning. Um, while we're on the topic, let's go ahead and continue because this is what happens sometimes, especially on a Freestyle Friday. Jason Nick says, I know we've talked about it and there's blame to go around, but how much does missing uh, World Cup hurt Altidore and Bradley and their U.S. legacy? Uh, it does. Um, and I think both of them took a lot of blame for it, unfairly, because it's not just them. Uh, the, the coaches did not take enough blame. Um, and I, I've, I've talked about Bruce Arena and how I feel about Bruce Arena in general. Um, he blew it in that last game against Trinidad. Horrible tactics, horrible lineup decision. Um, just as bad as you could get it wrong in, in a game that all you got to do is get a result to go through. He did well to rescue what Jurgen Klinsmann had screwed up before that, losing the first two games. And yeah, they were tough because you had Mexico and you went to Costa Rica, but only one team's ever survived losing their first two games in the hex. And they had to go through the playoff to do it, Trinidad in 2006. So you know, both of them were, were awful. There were bad individual performances throughout. I, I think in the game in Trinidad, Michael Bradley was set up to fail because you, you played one holding midfielder in that game against a team that's just going to play direct. And Trinidad had two players there to win the second ball. And, and Bradley couldn't deal with it. Um, I'll put blame on Tim Howard, too, for the goal that he gave up in that game because that was a, ooh, a bad goal for yeah. instance to give yeah. up, a really bad goal to give up. So, you know, it, it absolutely affected their legacies. I think it's hurt Bradley more than it's hurt Altidore. People have put you know, more blame on him because of wearing the captain's armband at that time, um, which is, yeah, there's more responsibility, but I think he got blamed for some stuff that wasn't on him. But it has affected how people feel about him. You know, people don't have those negative feelings uh, about Dempsey and Donovan in the same way. Uh, Donovan, there are some negative feelings for different reasons. Uh, Dempsey, I think, is generally beloved. Uh, You go back further, I mean, on the the goals and the caps and legends of the national team, you know, Kobe Jones, uh, I don't think, has that kind of baggage. Uh, Jeff Agus has some baggage because of the the own goals. Uh, He had a couple bad ones. Um, World Cup, which ended up not hurting them in 2002, and uh, a really bad one against Jamaica in qualifying, but they they were able to to weather that. Uh, You know, the further back you go, I think it's warmer feelings towards your your Claudio Reynas, your your DeMarcus Beasleys, who had an incredible national team career and just kept going and going and going. You know, Balboa and and, and Kobe and, you know, there's so many of them that don't have that baggage. Altidore and Bradley do have a lot of baggage that's maybe unfair. I'll 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 say it's unfair, and we've talked about the booing thing a lot. Yeah, a little harsh. Um, went on way too long to be a thing. Uh, I know people did it because it was fun, but in terms of actually blaming them for that, I think it went on way too long. Just my opinion, yeah. though. No, I agree. Um, it's past the top of the hour. You want me to do something? It is, yeah. Why don't you do something? Uh, why don't you tell us about our good friend over in Decatur, Steve Apolinski? I can do that. Apolinski and Associates, LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH network for wrongful death and serious injury matters. One communication that you need to make, and it is with Apolinski and Associates, LLC. A couple different ways that you can communicate with the firm. You can reach out to them via email. Hit up Steve directly, S-T-E-V-E, at aa-legal.com. You can get a free consultation by giving them a phone call, 404-377-9191, landline or cell. Or you can go on the World Wide Web, large device or small, type in aa-legal.com in the bar, hit enter, hit return, hit the arrow key, whatever advances it to that next screen. Apolinski and Associate LLC's homepage pops up, as does a pop-up window, because that's what pop-up windows do. Low right-hand corner, 24-7, 365 and a quarter, or 366 and a quarter in leap years. Thank you, Chris Hutchison, for that. And you can have a conversation right then and there with the individual to have questions answered in that pop-up window. Over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for their clients in Georgia and Alabama, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the top 100 firms in that their state of Georgia at their state for two more days. Then we can get back to cutting the actual promo starting on Monday. But for wrongful death and serious injury matters, Apolinski & Associates LLC, the website is aa-legal. 
Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this one today. All right. So it probably means what about a six and a half? Uh, I don't. I don't judge. I don't. I don't give scores. This is, this is not for me. Um, yeah, I, I was. I, I was wondering how people would respond, and it went the way I thought. First, I have to block a bot. Let me handle that. Okay. Is it Swedish? Uh, no, it's um, it's Cam Newton land with all the the wingdings and such. Um, minus one for rambling. Six, four. Very, when did I ramble? Very, you rambled about the the this here Georgia thing and you went you rambled and you kind of lost it there for a minute. All right. Uh minus 1 for the false start, minus 1 nobody has a landline except for John. Minus 1 uh still no research on the pop-up window, minus 1 too fast. Uh that there state uh, a serious drop in performance from yesterday at 3. Instead of this here state of Georgia, it has to be that there state of Georgia. I I'm pinned into a corner grammatically. Look at him trying to defend himself. Uh 6 not bad, but yesterday's heights weren't met. What a letdown from yesterday. Um, <laughs> more convinced after today that the anger over the laptop fueled his best performance. He promos better angry. Okay. Uh, Hutcho, Hutcho is, is telling you that the 366.25 thing is incorrect. Okay. Um, five from Ricky. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're just... So basically, what what everybody is telling me is is that I have to be angry to cut a better promo. I think so. I think that's what people learned yesterday, yes. All right. A clunker today. Take that into advisement. And Hutcho's trying to correct you here. It's 365.25, not 366.25. But in a leap year, would it not be 366 and a quarter? I don't think so. Okay. No, it's, it's, 365 and a quarter is definitely the baseline, but I figured that once you get into a leap year, it's 366, therefore, would it not be 366 and a quarter? I don't know this. I'm operating under the notion that a leap year just adds one to 365 and a quarter. No, so e- that was, each that was year worth- you get the quarter. That makes the leap year. You just don't actually take a quarter of, of a day and add it to a day. Okay. So you, you save it up for four years, and then you add the, the extra day. Oh, okay. It's good to know. Now you got a 2.1. Your score went down even further. <laughs> because of my lack of knowledge of astro- astronomy? Yes, and always assume that the bots are, the bots are Russian, not, a, ah. not anything else. Because I thought we had Swedish bots at one point. You're obsessed with the Swedish bots for some reason. Because they're different. They're new and different. What is, why does Sweden need bots? I don't know. That's a question for Sweden. Why are you? We why had, are them, you, why we are had you? them happen at one time, and I'm just I'm wondering if they're continuing their trend of being bots. That's why I was asking. Man, you're throwing shade at Sweden now? Craziness. Hey, I'm half Norwegian. I can do that. Absurd. Um, maybe Finnish bots for you, according to some. All right. We got, we got some other things to get into. Uh, let's talk about the Super Draft. Let's talk about what came out yesterday, a list of players that are eligible for the Super Draft. That will be next Thursday, January 21st. Three underclassmen in the Generation Adidas class, although there is still reportedly some negotiation about one more player that could be joining them. Uh, sophomore forward Calvin Harris from Wake Forest. Uh, sophomore midfielders Philip Mayaka from Clemson and Daniel Pereira from Virginia Tech. They're all internationals. Uh, Harris was born in England. Uh, his father played for Sheffield United. Gr- schooled in New Zealand. Resides in Hong Kong. Um, wow, that's very international. That's a uh, lot of stamps. Mayaka is originally from Kenya. Came to the States to go to Montverde Academy. Pereira moved from Venezuela to Roanoke um, as a teenager. His family sought asylum, leaving Venezuela, and played in high school and in the Roanoke area, and then went to Virginia Tech. Uh, Pereira is the one that I've kind of zeroed in on. If he falls to number five, where Atlanta United picks, that he could be an interesting pickup. Um, very technical, creative uh, central midfielder, but he can also play in the kind of midfield that I think you'll see here with 
like a six and two eights. He can play a little bit deeper. He can be a bit of a, a deeper lying playmaker. I don't think he's a true six, but I think he can be an attacking eight as well as he could be a 10. So he fits. He's, he's very technical. So I, I think he fits out of those three something Atlanta United could be looking for. Now, I know Tafka's already come in, and uh, Tafka, just because your name comes up, I'm going to play this. <laughs> because whenever I see it, I just have to assume that it is black helicopter time. But this time, it, it, it kind of black helicopter a little bit, Tafka. Um, you say with only three, as it added up, with only three generation Adidas players in the draft, there could be a fourth one. I've seen rumors about that. Ivis Galarsup has said there could be a fourth. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, Tafka says the chances of trading away our top pick just increased substantially. I'd say 70% chance of trading it away. 50% chance we simply trade back because we seem to go with more obscure selections anyways. The obscure selections I think have been because of where they've picked. You know, they haven't picked this high since the first time around and that's where you got Gressel and that's where you got Robinson. The thing that's hard about this one is just, you didn't have a normal fall season. You only had two conferences that had championships, that had tournaments, uh, ACC and Sunbelt. So I do think from what we've seen uh, from Atlanta United and where they are and probably who they scout and who they see the most, ACC guys would make sense. Um, And these are ACC guys as a Generation Adidas guys, first off. Will any of them fall to five? They did not fall to five in Ivis Galarsep's big board, which is the, the best one out there. He had Mayaka as the number one prospect, Harris number two, Pereira number three. Um, Ed Kizza, who uh, left Pittsburgh in October, um, left the team in October, and it wasn't really explained why. He didn't leave school. I don't really know the details there. Um, another Montverde Academy guy. Uh, he is a senior coming out. Um, he was listed number four, according to Galarsep. Number five is the other player who has not been signed to a Generation Adidas deal yet, but Galarsep expects him to, even now that you've had three announced, you, a lot of times you'll get a late signing. Ethan Bartlow uh, of Washington, a, a center back who is a ball-playing center back. Um, took free kicks for Washington. Uh, I know Dirty South Soccer had a, a little bit of a write-up on on prospects, and that was one of the points they made. Uh, his, his coach talked about his range of passing, which is something you're immediately going to jump to with the way Atlanta United's looking to play. He played for the USU 17 national team. Uh, good in the air, even though he's only six foot, playing center back. Um, solid, steady, but that range of passing is what immediately grabbed my attention. Now, he's not in the draft yet. If they sign him to a Generation Adidas deal, he could be somebody that would fit. Um, beyond that, you know, you are looking at both your your number one pick, which could go a few different directions. You could trade it. You could trade back. You could uh, trade it out of the first round entirely, or you could pick. You know, one of the players that we just mentioned, the top five on Galarsep's board, you're picking five. Uh, beyond that, there's a, a couple other players that kind of jumped out to me. Uh, Nabi Kibunguchi at UC Davis. The, the question is, is UC Davis, you know, it's a big step up in level. Um, can he make that jump? But he's another ball-playing center back. Uh, he's played as a six as well. So he has that ability to do both. That's an interesting kind of player that fits the way Atlanta United looks at their center backs. Uh, he's also played a lot in USL League 2, so he's one to keep an eye on. Uh, Josh Bauer was a, a really interesting one because he signed a short-term deal late in the 2020 season with Birmingham Legion uh, because they weren't playing. He went to New Hampshire. They didn't have games. So uh, center back who had a really good 2019 no games to play in, in 2020, so he signed a deal like, I want to say August in USL Championship. He only played three times, played 17 minutes. A uh, little bit more of a traditional center back. I don't know if he's as good of a fit here, but I think he will go in the top 10. Uh, you've got a couple others. David Egbo from Akron. Um, he was linked to Generation, of deals the last, Generation Adidas deals the last two years. Didn't sign one. Very fast, very dynamic. He would need an international spot, and that would be a, a question mark here. 
Another one who would need an international spot is Kimarni Smith, who had a, a great year in the short season this year, had a good year last year, but tailed off at the end. He can play up top, but he can play on the wing as well. He's English, uh, spent time in Sheffield Wednesday's academy. And if you're looking for a common thread, I know Tosco was saying obscure. I think the common thread, and, and you saw it with Gressel, you saw it with Nielsen, um, guys that you're picking that have pro experience. And it can be in the academy. If you're picking an international guy, you're going to pick somebody who went through kind of a pro academy setup because they, they, they step in a little bit easier because they've been in a, that kind of training environment. He Smith kind of jumps out at me a little bit as a kind of winger that could fit here. The international spot would be the hang-up. But I think you're also looking at what they could do with their second-round pick because it's it's number 32. It's it's you know early in the second round, and that's where you could get some players that you know are, are maybe a, a little bit more of a late bloomer, maybe a little bit more of a project, somebody who plays a lot for Atlanta United too. Uh, Michael DeShields at Wake Forest, another ACC guy. Uh, there's talk he might shift to outside back or as a six at the MLS level. Another ball-playing center back. Uh, he's been a top college center back, but he's good on the ball. Um, CC Uche from Ohio State. He had a season-ending injury four games into last season, but he's been training here locally. So he's been around. You know, have, have, have they had any conversations with him? He was listed number 28 on the uh, big board from Galarsep. Could he fall to 32? Yeah. I mean, the it's hard to predict an MLS draft. So, like, you see somebody 28. Could they be available at 32? Yeah, they absolutely could be available at 32. No, not the Ohio State ragamuffin. I am not doing that. <laughs> um, another one that, that jumped out to me was Yoni Sorokin from Central Florida, another really good technical player, uh, center mid kind of in the, the backyard a little bit. Um, his playing profile fits what we've seen from Atlanta United picks. Could he be somebody that you look at? Um, you could trade. You absolutely could. There's teams who would look at, you know, especially that number five pick, and you know, if it's Kizza, if it's uh, Kevin Gucci, if it's Bauer, if you know, one of those first three, Mayaka or Harris or Pereira fall, there's teams that would look at them and say, yeah, they could play for me this year. I mean, we we do see it. Not a ton. Not as much as we used to. But we do see it where players come straight in and play. Atlanta, they wouldn't. You know, I don't think any of the, the Generation Adidas guys would come in and play day one. Um, I don't think anybody in the draft would come in and start day one. Are there any of these players that could contribute in year one? Yeah. Uh, Pereira is the one to me that that's the most interesting, and he's the one that maybe people are definitively putting him behind Mayaka and Harris. So if three and four in the draft say, you know what, Pereira is still you know, more of a project for us, we're going to go towards you know Kizza because he's a little bit more of a veteran and he's older. We're going to go to to Bauer because of the experience he's had. If Pereira's there at five, I think Atlanta would snatch him up. Um, the comparison that I've seen, and I've talked about this player a lot, so it's no no brainer that I would like Pereira a lot. It's been compared to Frankie Amaya, in that kind of a player who can play from a deeper midfield position, but can jump forward and contribute to the attack, both scoring goals himself and creating them for others. That's the kind of player that would be really nice in the kind of system that we're going to see here now. He'd have a ton of competition, but a generation Adidas player in that kind of role, it's really good for your cap. It's really good for your roster to have somebody like that who could contribute. So I don't think, I, going back to Tafka's original tweet, um, I don't think they trade out right now. I don't think they trade out before the draft. If Pereira goes before five, could they trade out because the player that they might like the most is not available? Absolutely. But I don't think they trade out ahead of time. Because if he falls to five, he would fit. I think he would be a good fit. And if he plays mostly for the twos this season, that's fine. That's yeah. completely fine. One of the other elements that, that I'm going to be looking at, in addition to 
you know, generation D disc players and such, the conferences that played, how many of those players are taken in the early selections in round one, uh. as opposed to the possibly, you know, what has their stock been elevated because they got those reps as opposed to anybody else? No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, the ACC is always picked high anyway. So I don't think anything changed for the ACC. I, I the one to look at would be the Sun Belt, but right. I don't know if there's any Sun Belt players that are going to go high anyway. You know, I, I don't think it has to do with their stock being elevated. I just don't think there are any that are at that level. Um, Aris Briggs from Georgia State would be a wild card, maybe a second round pick, um, a big number nine. He, he wouldn't fit here, but could he find a place somewhere? Yeah, potentially. Um, What's interesting is now that you're getting into a point where if you're picked in the second round, it might be a better fit for you to just go sign a USL deal instead and, and be a top player for a USL team as opposed to being you know, deep on a roster for an MLS team. Uh, but we see second round and even third round players make it and contribute. You know, last year, I think, to, to Orlando and uh, Joey Desart who was picked late and ended up playing significant minutes for them in the middle of the season when they had injuries and they had things piling up. And he didn't look out of place. He was fine. Uh, he played here at, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and he was fine. So you can find those players. And Atlanta United puts a lot of time into scouting. So I think the, the question will be the player profile that Gabriel Heinz is looking for. Can he find some of those guys here? He likes working with young players. He likes coaching players up. He likes developing players. Do you see guys in this draft that have the raw characteristics that can be Atlanta United players in a Gabriel Heinze way of playing? I think there are some here. And there could be some in the second round, too. So I don't think they trade out early. But, yes, they could trade depending on how the first five picks or first four picks go. They could trade at that point. And yeah. we'll wait and see. Yeah, I've, I've always, you know, when you're looking at draft situations, you don't want to play your hand too soon. Yeah, I don't. And I you're, you're waiting on everybody else ahead of you. You don't want to sit there and go ahead and give everybody else more evidence or whatever to go ahead and go a certain direction. You don't want to play your hand. And so you wait until that last possible moment, even to the point to where you may be even on the clock. Or can anticipate where those folks ahead of that folk ahead, the, the team ahead of you is going to go before you make that move. Merritt Paulson's tweeting. Um, he said, after looking at my timeline this morning, I won't have fun with emoji responses to silly season rumors anymore, at least not this year. Falcao's a top player slash personality, and I'd love to see him in MLS. But for the record, the Timbers are not engaged with him or his folks. Sorry, Falcao fans. Merritt Paulson squashes all the fun. On a Friday, man. Squashing all the fun on a Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So let me get into some questions because there's been a few that have come up during all of this uh, stuff with the draft. Uh, Thomas DeWin says, I'll be very surprised if Atlanta United 2 takes an international player in the draft, need those spots for bigger signings. My pushback would be uh, if you take an international player knowing that they're not going to play with the first team this year and loan them to Atlanta United 2, to give them time to develop, you can make it work because then they don't take up an international spot on the first team. So a, a guy like Pereira, for me, would be somebody who you'd want some. You'd want him to play. You'd want seasoning with him. He's a little bit of a late bloomer. So if you if you picked him, you would probably put him on a season long loan to Atlanta United too. So you could still make that work. Uh, I don't think you would be picking an international guy with the expectation that they would play a lot of minutes with the first team this year. I, I agree with that. But you could do it for somebody that you're going to develop. I, I think that could work. Um, question, and a bunch of people were asking it, about the players that had Atlanta United 2 listed next to them on the list. And it, it was very confusing, and I, I don't know the answer to this. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. There were a few different players in this kind of situation, not even just Atlanta United, two players uh, with this list. So, uh, Javian Brown and Chris Allen. Uh, Brown's from South Florida. 
Allen is from University of Charleston. They were both listed on the, the draft list from MLS as Atlanta United 2 players. They haven't been announced as Atlanta United 2 players, so I don't know what that means. Um, they are eligible for the Super Draft. Uh, also, Daniel Steedman, who played for Atlanta United 2 last year, was listed as eligible for the Super Draft. That's a little different, and because we don't always get enough information to understand some of these things from MLS, and I really hope that's something that they try to uh, address here at some point. We, we don't know. Um, I'm going to read you what their release says. Players eligible for selection in the MLS Super Draft 2021 presented by Adidas include college seniors. Makes sense. Generation Adidas players. Makes sense because they have signed deals with the league. And players who waived their college eligibility by signing to play in a domestic professional league since the conclusion of the 2019 college soccer season. Now, I, I wonder if that is somewhat down to the uniqueness of 2020 and, and a player like Bauer, for example. You know, we got into this with the, uh, the NWSL with uh, Macario. And would somebody try to draft her rights? Now, the NWSL rules were that once you signed a pro deal, you were not eligible for the draft. So you couldn't draft her rights. MLS has, has went a different direction. Bauer signed a pro deal with Birmingham in last season. So he waived his college eligibility, but he is in the draft and he will probably go in the top 10. Now the two players that have been linked to Atlanta United two on here, again, they haven't been announced as signings, but you know, this is where you're starting to hear some USL signings. So have they signed deals? Maybe. I I don't know why else MLS would have listed them as Atlanta United two players. So I don't really have an answer to that, but that's a change, and I, I'm, I'm assuming you have that because of what happened with the college season this year. Steedman's a, a little bit of an odd one because, well, he did, no, he, he would fit because he signed after the 2019 college season. He signed ahead of the 2020 season, waiving his college eligibility. But does that mean, do players in that situation just automatically go into the draft eligible list? Or do the players have to opt in? It doesn't sound like they do. Yeah. So I, I don't really know how that works. We saw it with, did we see it with Dylan Castanera, who was drafted in MLS, but signed an Atlanta United two deal. So he couldn't be signed by Atlanta to join the first team in MLS. And I think that's ultimately why they didn't keep him with Atlanta United 2, because there was no way they could push him up. They would have had to trade for his rights. Now, ultimately, Miami did, and they traded for his rights, and then they signed him. And there you go. They signed him to Fort Lauderdale. But he signed in the system, and they had his MLS rights. So I don't know Steedman's uh, long-term contract situation, but... Could he be drafted by an MLS team? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if he would. I don't know where he'd fit on that board. I don't think Galarsep was factoring those guys into this kind of thing. So I don't know. I, it's, it's a weird one. I, I'm guessing it's just trying to figure out the way the college season worked out and trying to give as many different people an opportunity here. But the two that are linked that we did not know about with Atlanta United 2, that I know nothing about. You know, I, I, I'm assuming they have signed Atlanta United 2 deals because of the way they're listed here. Uh, a fullback sophomore from South Florida in Brown and a uh, midfielder from Charleston in Allen. So I'm guessing they are under contract to Atlanta United 2 for the upcoming season. But again, we don't really know. And it'd be a situation like Castanera in that case uh, where they have decided to leave college. They have signed USL deals, but their rights could be drafted in the MLS draft. Yeah, Tafka is coming in, and he he's saying make a deal with Nashville, give them the five for international slots. Need, when you know we'll need them, get them now, save money later. No, nah, don't save money. Later. Don't do anything yet. Don't do anything yet. You wait and see. You might have something on deck, uh, yeah. but that price could go up for the five depending on who's available. That's the mm-hmm. thing you never know. Uh, if you've seen the movie Draft Day. You see how these things can go. When somebody starts to fall in the draft, things can get weird. And if 
then somebody gets desperate and wants to go get that player, then maybe you get an even better deal. Got to be ready to wheel and deal. Got to be yeah. ready to, to do what you got to do. Who is this year's Bo Callahan? We won't find out until draft day. I hope there's not a Bo Callahan in, in this because he, he wasn't that good of a guy. Um, no. A little, a little shady. So mm-hmm. hopefully there's none of these players that are a Bo Callahan. That, that, that would not be cool. Nope. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know the situation with Allen and Brown. So I've, I've got nothing. Um, let's see. What else we got? Uh, Burn says, is anybody dumb enough to trade a bunch of gam for all of Philly's picks again? Whew. I don't, their picks aren't as good anymore, though. So, no. Yeah. No, they're, nobody's that dumb anymore. Um, Sam Williamson says, so do you think we could find our six in the super draft instead of shopping the market? No. You need a, you need a, a starter level number six. All the players that we've talked about in the super draft, um, there are players who will have good professional careers in the super draft. There are players who will have good years next year in the super draft. I don't think there's anybody that fits what Atlanta United needs in that position in the super draft. There, there's not a holding midfielder that can step in and play in the system that, that Gabriel Heinze wants. The, there's not one on the board that, that I know of that would be that fit. But will you see guys you know, go into teams and, and do well? Absolutely. You know, you look back at, at last year's Super Draft, uh, Henry Kessler was really good for New England this year. And he was picked number six. Daryl DK went number five for Orlando. Um, yeah, kind of good. Uh, Dylan Nealis for Miami played a good bit for them. He was the three pick. Robbie Robinson played some for Miami. Um, I, know, I think they might want that pick back when they could have taken DK yeah. there. Uh, he was the number one pick. Jack Mayer uh, didn't play a ton for Nashville this year, but he was starting to get in the mix a little bit more in training towards the end. Y- you scroll down. I mean, Seagrass started the first two games for the Red Bulls before the pandemic hit. Alistair Johnston was number 11, and he ended up starting consistently at the end of the year for Nashville. That was a great pick at 11. Uh, who else did we have out of the draft last year? Nielsen, it's kind of a shame for him because he had the injuries and had bad luck. I think if he had been able to play for Atlanta United too, maybe we're having a different conversation about him, but you just didn't get enough out of him to do another deal with him. So uh, Nielsen had bad luck, and that happens sometimes. Achara for Toronto uh, had bad luck with injuries. He was somebody they were looking at. Um, Desart we mentioned, at 31 for Orlando, who played some, not a ton, but some important minutes for them when they needed him. I think he was the latest one last year that contributed. Yeah, he was. Uh, they have cut the draft down to three rounds and not four because there, there's no need to go four rounds because a lot of teams will pass on their third pick. You don't need to go four rounds anymore. Uh, but you go back two years, go back to 2019 to see what the draft can do for you at this point. Amaya was number one. Love that pick. Uh, Shin Yashiki was number five. Rookie of the year. Really good pick for Colorado. Uh, Dane St. Clair was number seven. Ended up paying off big time for, for Minnesota. Tejon Buchanan was number nine. Ended up being huge for New England as the year went on this year. Uh, your namesake, John Nelson with an H for Dallas. No relation. Yes. Ended up playing a lot of minutes for Dallas. He was number 10. Dewan Jones was 11. Another guy who played a lot of minutes for New England. Chase Gasper has played his way into the national team picture. Number 15. It can happen. Um, it can be, you know, kind of a wild card situation too with some. I mean, you know, Janos Lube was picked by the Red Bulls at 22. He's played primarily in the second division. Anderson Aseadu was Atlanta's pick at 24. Didn't make it. He's played in Birmingham. Uh, Sean Nealis was 25 to start the second round. He's played a lot for the Red Bulls. Kamal Miller, Orlando got a nice return on him. Playing and then in a trade. He was 27. Hassani Dotson was 31, another guy who's had national team time. Reese Buckmaster played a decent bit for the Red Bulls in his first year there. He was 32. It, it can happen. But it gets harder to predict the further down you go. And I think now you're starting to see so many players go the homegrown route, so many players go into academies that it's getting harder to predict in the top 10 as well. But there are players that you can find that can contribute. Atlanta has the luxury of picking somebody that can develop, and we'll see if they can. Pereira is the one who keeps jumping out at me the more I look at it. 
On a Freestyle Friday, you want to hit the Twitters? Sure, let's do it. Uh, the Airborne DJ, Tom Russo, definitely freestyling with this thought. Oh, boy. Reminded of the conversation about people backing into parking spots, which actually doesn't bother him at all, but far worse is people who, in a crowded lot, get to their car, start up the car, then sit there on their damn phone for 10 minutes before they leave. That's always bad. Um, and I do check my phone before I leave, but if I am in a close parking spot or a crowded parking lot, I do not. Um, I have even pulled out of a spot and pulled to the back of a parking lot to check my phone before in those yep. situations. Uh, why do I check my phone before I start driving? Because of what happened when Frank DeBoer uh, announcement came. Because I had been at uh, 92.9. I was on from 10 to 2 on the midday show, filling in, and nothing had happened. And I said my goodbyes and uh, went down the elevator and got to the car. And again, I checked my phone, and there were plenty of parking spots around, so I wasn't holding anybody up. And see the the tweet that Frank DeBoer was no longer the manager of Atlanta United. I was like, okay, now i got to run back upstairs. Yep. So I I do that to see if I've missed anything, but I will not do it to hold anybody up. I am thoughtful about that. So Tom Russo, don't yell at me. Cuppers wants to know which of the new stadia are you most looking forward to going to or are excited about? <clears throat> Austin. Austin. I want to see it. I want to go to Austin. That'll be fun. I've never been to Austin. Um, I want to see what a new team looks like in that situation. Uh Cincinnati will be cool. I, I liked Nippert in a lot of ways. Yeah. Nippert was weird um, from a a layout. Like it, it felt like we were straight up in the position we were in. It was very steep. But I liked Nippert being on a college campus. It was kind of weird, kind of a different feel entirely. Uh, but I want to see what their new new spot looks like. Columbus's new spot. Um, is there another one I'm missing, or is that is that it for this year? Is that the three? I think Miami, because I mean we haven't been to Fort Lauderdale, so um, you know it's not their permanent spot. But yeah, uh, that's always an interesting one. But Austin's the winner for me. Yeah, that one has already been uh, reserved and plotted for a road trip. Columbus will be cool. Strummer John asked about Columbus. Columbus will be cool because the location's really good. I think. Um, from what I from what I know of that area, and I don't know Columbus all that well. It's much better than the fairgrounds where they were, but it's a, it, like I like the layout for Columbus. I like the way that stadium looks. It has a little bit different feel, so I'm intrigued by it. But Austin, just the whole package of going to Austin and, and the stadium, all of it. Nashville Maybe. opens next year. Burned. Yeah. Uh, I think it's another year at, at Nissan. I think even a year and a half potentially at yeah. Nissan. Yeah, because I thought I remembered it as a summer uh, introduction. Yeah, I think it got pushed back to a summer opening. Uh, Nathan Pugh, freestyling this morning as well. Okay. Apropos of nothing, but I'm a simpleton and laugh at stupid things and know that I'm the only one laughing. Don't be so sure. So I can't help but pronounce the new team name for the mighty feet of Montreal and not sound like the Swedish chef, and he provided an audio clip. No, oh, no. No, no, no. And he does sound like the Swedish chef. That's not good. When, when discussing the, uh, the new Club de Football de Montreal. That's not good. I, I don't hate it. I know a lot of people do. They should have left Impact in the name. I like the logo. I know a lot of people don't. I like it. Um, I, think it I think it works. Uh, I'm okay with it. Uh, lean into the French. Lean into it. It makes you unique. Uh, Turner Kirby linking to an article over at NBC Sports where the title of the article is NHL Gambles on Getting Through the Pandemic Outside a Bubble. Turner's response, wow, it's almost like acting like adults and sitting down to discuss the issues creates solutions that benefit everyone. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? It's it's definitely crazy. What's going on with the NHL and how they're structuring on their stuff? Uh, it's uh, per venue, and uh, they've separated. It's like the Canadian division has literally the Canadian teams are playing each other. They're in one division. They have four separate divisions. And you can play in, in Ontario province. You were supposed to start playing in home venues, but that was pulled back recently because of the, the number spikes. But the plan is in Canadian teams to play in their home venues. Last night, to give you an example, uh, Arizona 
was uh, playing in their home venue. And a lot of folks would sit there and maintain that the crowd that was there last night pretty much resembles a crowd that's there normally, so it wasn't anything different. But there was a crowd last night at Gila River, and uh, they were loud. And so it's a uh, case-by-case basis right now, especially with some states having uh, issues with quarantines and such. But there are uh, opportunities to play in home venues, and Arizona last night was one of those examples to do that. Uh, it's going to be weird. I mean, it's going to be hard for these leagues and these teams to figure all this stuff out. That's why everybody needs to stop the bluster and actually just sit down and talk through it because it's not going to be easy for anybody. So I I hope that they can. I hope maybe they've gotten the bluster out of them. I I hope people don't continue to pump hot air into this thing. Um, People need to be a little more responsible about this. And I think the people involved in making these decisions need to be a little more responsible about the, the, the things they are putting out there in the media because it's not going to help get a deal done work together and get something done uh taka off the stephen goff article says this is why you keep your business completely locked down and quiet atlanta united fan base could only say what's taking so long with no knowledge of anything here fans can criticize dc united for failing to hire its previous choices and the choice will hardly feel desired in quotation marks yeah it's two different things i mean you know i don't believe that dc united is you know leaking news to stephen goff maybe they are intentionally i don't think they should because it's a bad look because of exactly the things that are said there um i think stephen goff just has been in that job for so long that he has a ton of connections and he gets a lot of information he's he's good at what he does so it's it's two different things like any team should want to keep everything under wraps every every team should be really careful with news getting out on these things because of exactly what's said you know if okay we're chasing this guy well they can't get that guy oh well i thought we were going to get that guy so now we're really disappointed you know i mean that's what happened with with moises caicedo people will be like ah they're really disappointed They, they failed in getting him they made a good offer it seems like and we don't know that for sure and the team didn't say anything because that's not what they do but then people will be like, oh, well, this guy's not Moises Caicedo. Well, maybe you couldn't actually get that deal done. Reporters got to do their jobs, and, and they do their jobs, and they talk about news, and they break things as they find them. The team's got to keep it as under wraps as they can. And here, look, nothing's getting out. <laughs> Nothing is getting out of this front office when stuff's going down. When it's happening, when we hear things about Atlanta United rumors, it's happening from other countries because it's, it's other people talking, not people talking locally so it's a it can help you if you do things right and and for dc's situation now i mean it it looks like a a cluster and maybe it has been and maybe it hasn't but that's what it looks like because we've heard a lot about it bartimus prime is in freestyling on a friday which MLS clubs actually need a rebrand? Which EPL club should redesign their crest ASAP? For me, New England, it needs a rebrand from top down. Burnley's crest is bad and needs to be modernized and simplified. Okay, I will quickly do this off the top of my head. We've seen a lot of rebrands in MLS, and we're going to leave Chicago out of it because they are planning one, and they have a good plan forward with that. Um, LA Galaxy need a rebrand the worst. Yeah. The New England one, I'm, you can tweak. I don't think they need a full rebrand. Uh, the Galaxy need a new crest in the worst way. That thing looks awful now. I didn't think it looked good to begin with. It looks awful now. Uh, it, it stands out to me when I go through the list of crests at, at MLS Soccer and you see them all lined up and you see them you know, compared to one another. The Galaxy one is the one my eyes go to as that looks out of place. That's the one that I like the least. Like the name, fine, don't change it. The crest, change it. And it sounds like for their, according to Footy Headlines, their um, alternate kit is going to be back to the old school kind of, I don't remember what color they called it. It's not quite teal. It's it's a pretty unique color that they used to use a lot in their their uniforms. Incorporate that. Change the logo. The LA Galaxy logo is awful, in my opinion. Um, In the Premier League... And this is a lot harder to do because 
you've got a ton of history attached to these things, so you've got to be super careful about changing it because people get mad. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard for me too because again, I'm coming at it from a different perspective. Which one? Which one is the LA Galaxy? When I look at the crest lined up, that I go to like oof. Hmm. There's not one immediately that does that. Um, the two that I keep going back to are Wolves and Fulham. Yeah. The Wolves one I don't like. I, I think the Wolves one is the, the one for me. Yeah. I mean, Fulham has always been that, that classic... Uh, FFC and, down the middle. And that's and, what's hard because you have history, and that's probably why I'm a little more forgiving of the, the New England Revolution one. I don't think you should change the name for sure with the Revs. And if you do a, a new crest or something and and change things up, I don't think you go away from what they've done too far. So I, it wouldn't be a dramatic rebrand, but if you freshen it up, that's fine. The Wolves... And the LA Galaxy crests are the ones that I think need to go. Yeah, no, I I, I would agree there. Sorry, uh, Wolves fans, this, go yeah. ahead and yell at me. It's fine. Well, and and how you know how old is that wolf? Maybe you could modernize the wolf design instead of making it look like something from Terminator movies out of the eighties or something. Yeah, I don't like know that. how old that crest is. It doesn't feel like the others and, and Thomas Jewin says it's fun because it looks so different and it's really simple and, and yeah it, it does stand out that way but I don't think it works it, it doesn't to me but it, I'm no marketing expert in this regard it just feels so different that it it doesn't work as well to me and, and maybe that's being unfair to wolves um, yeah those are the two that keep my eye keeps going back to Brighton's is kind of boring Maybe yeah, they do but they're the, goal, they're the seagulls, and so I get it. That's part of their history. Yeah, but they can still do something better than what they have. Modernize it? Yeah, Burnley's isn't very good, but it, it does look like an old English crest to me. So, I mean, I, and that's going to have a different feel than than I would obviously have. So, you know, people are going to be more attached to that kind of look. Uh, yeah, Wolves, Fulham, I, I think you can freshen up. Um Brighton, you could do more with. Okay, that's where I'm at. Rapid fire from Jake Michaels. Sure. Would Pavone fit in Atlanta? No. Not with what you have right now. Um, if you didn't have Jurgen Dom or Ezekiel Barco, sure, but you do. And you're not going to go add another one on top of it. If you moved Barco, we'd be having a different conversation, but no, I, I don't. I don't think he's uh, the right fit. How could CBA negotiations potentially affect Atlanta's transfer moves, if at all? I don't think it'll affect it. We've steered away from positional play, but how do you see Lopez fitting into the squad next year? Um. Well, let me let me clarify. We haven't steered away from positional play as a game model. That 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 will be the game model. I, I think maybe the the references to actual positions on the field. Uh, Lopez, we saw him in the CONCACAF match play in that central attacking midfield role, a uh, lot higher up, you know, a little different than we've generally seen players in that role. He could play there because he's played as a second striker and it's, it's not that different. Um, I think he can play out wide too. Uh, and he can obviously play as a number nine, but I think the places he would fit in, Gabriel Heinze's base, which will be more out of a, a 4-3-3 kind of shape. I think it's as a central attacking midfielder. I think it's wide or as a number nine. I think we all love Dom as a person, but curious, do you think he's a starting caliber winger in MLS? I think he can be, but curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, 100% think he's a starting level winger in MLS. 100%. Does Atlanta have enough depth at the moment to handle international call-ups? Uh, yeah, I think they're actually pretty deep. Um, you know, you, you go through the, the roster and there's not a lot of positions that I don't think you have options, good options. I mean, goalkeeper. Okay. Uh, Alec can, 
I, I don't worry if Alec can's in goal. Left back, okay, Bellow's gone. You have Ambrose. I don't worry about that. Center back, you've got Meza, you've got Escobar, you've got Robinson, you've got Walks. You've got four good ones there. I don't worry about that. Right back, you've got Lennon, you've got Escobar, you've got Walks. Okay, and Walks can play on the left as well, so you've got cover there. The six, I, I think you, you are looking for a starter, but you have Mo Adams, you have Eric Rometty, um, you have potentially Meza who could step into that. I think maybe it's a little bit better of a fit with the, the things you're going to ask the six to do going forward. So, okay, you've got cover there. The, the eight slash tens, depending on how you want to do it, we went through that a ton. You've got a bunch of different options, no problems. Uh, on the left wing, you've got Barco, you've got Lopez, who I think could factor in there. You've got Mulraney, who can play there. You're good. On the right wing, you've got Dom, you've got Lennon, you've got Wolf, you've got Mulraney, okay? You've got Lopez. And up top, you've got Joseph, you've got Lopez, you've got John, you've got Conway, you've got Wolf, who would give you a different look up there. Yeah, I, I, th- I think you've got cover. I, I, there's not a position that I'm like, you don't have enough depth. I think when we talk about depth, sometimes we're like, okay, the, the backup has to be just as good as the starter. And that's impossible in a league like MLS. But you've got the cover. You're, you're built pretty well with this roster. Andrew Bucciolato in our discussion of rebranding says Fulham. I love the classic Fulham banner, but let's get something showing over the original London club on there. And for MLS, he says New England or possibly San Jose. feel like they San could Jose embrace maybe. a neon or electric look with their color scheme. Yeah, San Jose maybe. Um, that's a good shout. They were the uh, probably the next one. I keep going to the Galaxy one. I just I don't know of anybody who just loves that Galaxy look. Yeah, and in doing some quick research, it's being referred to as teal, like literally teal, with gold side panels and shoulder yoking with black accents. Oh, I thought they had some kind of uh, something teal or something to it. Maybe not. Uh, the Wolves logo was redone in 2002. Thanks for everybody chiming in on that. Um, it already looks outdated. Yeah. It just doesn't work for me. Uh, Thomas Jawin posted a list of their history. The one previous was, was even worse from 96 to 2002. Uh, man, they've had some bad logos. Yeah. <laughs> they've had some really bad logos. They, they need to go back to the drawing board entirely. Wolves is my pick for that. Yeah. Uh, also on the board, uh, let's see. What are we looking? Oh, uh, Tafka says, Josie's 31. Somehow he managed to stay 29 for multiple years in my head. Pretty much. That's because he was out with a hamstring injury for a couple of years, it seems like. Uh, Nathan Pugh getting ready for this weekend using the hashtag gas sliding down here, Pretty quoting much. Jürgen Norbert Klopp. But I am not Sir Alex, and this is not mind games. Yes, it is. And you're trying to be, <laughs> and you're you're scared, and you need to not be so scared, Jürgen Klopp. Get a puppy. Uh, let's see. What else is on the board? Um... Let's see. John Mason, who's out at the training ground running drills these past couple days on a freestyle Friday? Don't know. Probably Academy. Um, I, I don't know what kind of rules or restrictions you'd have with Atlanta United 2 players, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's Academy because I think they were getting back out to training. Uh, Andy Hollum says that New England definitely needs a rebrand. Never like the Whitecaps logo. Not a huge fan of the Rapids. If I were a Red Bulls supporter, just threw up in my mouth a little bit, I'd want them sold which would necessitate a rebrand. Right. Two of my favorite logos a couple of years ago were Fire and Impact, and now they're both gone. Yeah, the Montreal one, they kept t- shifting it and tweaking it and doing different things to it. I never loved the last one they had. Uh, the Fire logo was really good. They made it worse. They're going to go through a process to improve it, so uh, I'll give them time to do it. I, I, I guess I'm in the minority on the Revolution one. That's fine. I think it's just the history of it at this point. It's been around so long that I'm like, all right, it, it's normalized to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could refresh it. I wouldn't rebrand it. I would rebrand the Galaxy look and feel entirely. Revs, I would refresh it. San Jose, you could refresh it. Um, I, I'm okay with Vancouver. I don't, I don't have any, any dislike for Vancouver. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm okay with Vancouver's as well. Uh, and then Nathan says, uh, do not forget about this particular crest redo, and it's the crest redo of West Brom. With the gravy boat, I don't remember that. I think I think a lot of folks are looking at uh, Big Sam 
and saying, yep, yeah, we'll just make it a gravy boat instead of a bird, West Brom. I don't think he's going to be there long enough for any kind of a rebrand. Uh, I, I think they get relegated, and I think he loses his streak, and I think he's gone. Yep. And that catches us up on the Twitters. All right. A um, couple other things that are popping up. Uh, Sinclair gave an update on their direct-to-consumer plans and their carriage dispute with Hulu and YouTube TV. The Streamable has it. And uh, thank you to Ricky Ricardo for posting this in the Twitch pitch. Um Let's see what we got. Uh, Chris Ripley, their CEO, revealed last year that they would be launching a new app to replace Fox Sports Go because they're getting away from the Fox branding because they're not owned by Fox anymore. Um, Their executive vice president and CFO uh, revealed a few more details about this stuff. They're in the process of developing a world-class sports app to replace the Fox Sports Go app. I'm glad it's world-class and not, you know, we're, we're developing a janky app that will not yes. be very good to replace the Fox Sports Go app. I'm, I'm glad they're striving yeah. for world class. Uh, yeah, expect to launch the app this spring. Viewing experience will be significantly better. It will be enhanced, personalized, interactive. Buzzword, 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 buzzword. Um, yeah. They want to incorporate sports betting stuff into it, which makes sense with some of the other things we've heard about Bally's and all of that. So, okay, get it. Totally understand that. Um, they... Uh, the best way to think about our direct-to-consumer piece, it's a complimentary and additive offering for the viewer. Okay. Um, they did shed some light on the disputes with YouTube TV, with Hulu Live, with Fubo TV, uh, Dish Network and Sling TV dropped the channels previously. Currently, the channels, the regional sports networks, are only available during or in the AT&T TV choice plan. Uh, when asked about why they don't allow the skinny bundles to tier the channels, uh, this is coming from, let me get the right person's name, uh, the executive VP and CFO, Lucy Rudischauser. She said, um, every MVPD discussion, whether it's traditional or virtual, is its own negotiation. These are all highly, highly negotiated contracts. And then... There could be MFNs, most favored nations, within. The other side may have MFNs to negotiate within. Okay, a lot of things trying to confuse all of us. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's kind of unfortunate that YouTube and Hulu dropped the RSNs at times when those contracts were coming up and we didn't have any sports. Normally, you go for MLB into NHL into NBA, and you'd have this continuity of local sports. That didn't happen this fall because of COVID, and as a result, there weren't any sports on in the fourth quarter until the NBA started up in the last week of December. Uh, Yes, there's a league called Major League Soccer. You might want to look into it. Mm -hmm. Um, Right now, it doesn't appear like either side's ready to budge. Uh, This is what Rudy Schauser said. It remains remains seen on the virtual side what takes place there and now that the NBA is back on and NHL just started yesterday. We have to see the demand it drives to those systems to get RSNs back on or to see if subscribers migrate to a system where they can watch their local teams. Sinclair pointed to them as a cause for a, quote, decline in distribution revenue, as well as, quote, elevated levels of subscriber erosion in their third quarter earnings report. The company expects cord cutting and the loss of YouTube TV and Hulu to lead to a 10% decline in subscriber revenue. Well, don't you want to get that revenue back in some form or fashion? Just saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, that that really doesn't tell you a whole lot. That's no. kind of strange. There's a lot of word salad. The question I have, yeah, there's a whole lot of word salad. The question I would have about it is this app that you're going to do, are you going to create it where it is tied to having a subscription to somebody, or are you going to create it as an over-the-top? If they create it as an over-the-top, then I understand what they're doing because they are trying to bring that money in themselves. If they're not, if it's going to be like the old Fox Sports Go app, then what are they doing? Because I don't understand it. Yeah. Right. So let's, let's see how that plays out. But it's not sounding all that great at the moment. Right. Uh, I think yeah. it, I, it sounds like there might be leaning toward over the top. It needs to be, yeah, because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Any, any of the rest of it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see if Sinclair continues to frustrate folks or if they come up with this idea. 
We shall see. Uh, Thomas DeWin says the Fox Sports Go app is terrible. Glad they're replacing it. Uh, they stopped updating it whenever this deal started. Like it, it was fine when it first started. It was actually really good. Um, they stopped updating it as as Fox was getting out of the regional sports game. So it's yeah, it, it's really bad now. Yeah. Anything else on Twitter? No, nope, we are caught up, sir. Okay. Sam Williamson says, so is Gutman going to come, going to play for us, or do we just have his rights? Right now, we just have his rights. Uh, I don't know where he's going to play, because he's not going to play at Celtic, so I don't understand it. Um, I don't know what Celtic's doing with him. Um, don't know if there's been conversations or not. So right now, you have his rights, and you see if you can get a deal done, but you also signed to Mikey Ambrose for additional cover, and you're good for that. Um... A lot of talk about all the confusion with everything with the regional sports networks. Jared underscore Smith says the uh, the contracts are very, very complicated. I uh, would do them well to get this done soon. Plenty of folks are missing Hawks right now. Braves and United coming up. And in an era where going to games is not an option, great job, Sinclair. Mm-hmm. I, it's hard to say. I do think baseball might be the trigger for them. I think so. I don't think they can afford to not have it back for baseball. I thought that would be the NBA. I really thought the NBA contracts that they have would be the trigger, but obviously it hasn't been. Um, People will go nuts if they can't watch baseball. Yeah. Older folks who will scream and and yell a lot will Mm -hmm. go nuts if they have cut the cord by now. And that's the other question is – you know, are those viewers still just getting games on cable? And if they are, then maybe they don't go nuts. I don't know. And now I'm now I'm wondering. I don't know. Um, it, it's it, it shouldn't be this long. It should not be dragging out this long unless they're trying to go over the top with their app and bypass this stuff. And if they are, well, then that's going to be a big change in the way they distribute stuff. So I don't know. And and no, Sinclair Sinclair traditionally has never won over sports fans, and no. I, I like you. I would have thought that the NBA season would have uh, been their number one indicator. Maybe the notion of only playing you know sixty three percent of the schedule is you know not motivating them since it's not a full grid or what have you. NBA is playing a lot more than sixty three percent of the schedule. Was it fifty? Uh, no, sorry, I'm thinking of the National Hockey League. Yeah, sorry, yeah they're missing like yeah. ten games. Yeah. So uh, National Hockey League, sixty-three percent of the schedule. NBA is missing a handful of games. I would have thought that the NBA would have been the trigger, but no. I guess they're saving it up for baseball. Well, we'll see. Um, we will finish with this. Uh, Steve Bruce. Sorry, Alex. Pacino, uh, I apologize in advance. Um, Steve Bruce it spoke to the media, and he is is not happy. Um, He said, the criticism of him has been personal from day one. He won't give in. The personal from day one and won't give in are quotes. Uh, He did say he picked the wrong team uh, against Sheffield United. Okay. Um, I've I've made a career of never giving in, so I won't now. I will keep trying to do my utmost to make this better. Uh, It has been personal from day one. Certain people out there think I shouldn't have been in the job to start with. All I can do is accept it and try not to be too down with it. Okay. Um, But I keep stressing... Oh, he says, uh, talking just in general about the way the team's played. I understand the supporters' frustration and anger. I would be the same way. Then why aren't you changing it? Uh, But Uh I keep stressing, if you are in the bottom half of the Premier League, you have to be a bit pragmatic. Now getting that balance right, I fully, fully understand. Have Newcastle been a good watch for years? We've been in the bottom half of the Premier League. Now we're not saying it's acceptable, but it's the way it is. So we have to have a certain way of defending well, but I agree. We have to offer more going forward. I expect the players to mirror myself a little bit. I was never blessed with wonderful ability, same as management, but the one thing I expect is a reaction. Show some pride in yourself and never be afraid of hard work. At the minute, it's hard work, but you try not to get too down. We are not alone. If you're in the bottom half, there will be times when you come under pressure, and this is one of those times. 16th in goals scored, 15th in the table. You've lost three of your last four. You're not a good watch right now. No. You're, you, the, the thing that, that's frustrating about them more than anything is they're, they don't go forward. 
and they're passive defensively. That, that's an awful combination. You're, you're not trying to attack, and you're not trying to defend with any kind of pressure. You're just there. You're just there trying to limit damage. And uh, since I, I brought this up, and I'm sorry, Alex, I will try to translate what Alex just said in the Twitch pitch. I believe it goes something like, Yes. I think it was like that. And, and that would yeah. have been my reaction to those comments as well. Because so here, here's, the next handful of, here's the next handful of matches for Newcastle. Okay. Arsenal. Villa. E. E. Leeds. Everton. That gets you out of January. Crystal Palace. Southampton. Chelsea. Manchester United. Wolves. And that gets you to March. That's not good. No. Uh, Alex does point out they have the best chance to conversion rate in the Premier League because they create like two chances per game. Exactly. <laughs> um, yes, that, that is why. Uh, I'm sorry, Alex. I apologize for you having to suffer through this nonsense. It could be so much better. That's, and that's what I'm frustrated with is just the way he talks about his team, he's basically saying they're crap. And I don't think he has crap talent at all. I think he's got far more talent than he tries to play with a style. The way he's describing it, we're a bottom half team, and when you're a bottom half team, you've got to be this, and you're not very good, and he didn't say that, but that's what he's implying. Yeah. I think talent-wise, Newcastle should not be surrounded by Sheffield United, West Brom, Fulham, Brighton, Burnley. Wolves shouldn't be where they are either. Uh, Crystal. I think we've seen what the loss of uh, Jimenez has meant to to Wolves. Yeah, and and that's that that happens. We saw it here in Atlanta this past year. Um, But talent wise, Newcastle should be mid table. Clearly mid table to me. Mm -hmm. Talent wise, with the players they have, and they're being managed like they are a bottom five talent team. And that's unacceptable. I mean, the the false tens thing? Like, really? You're going to say that out loud? Like, what are you doing, man? Just like, let players play and, and actually look at the players you have. I mean, I, I've, I've seen so many people now, the, the spin, and, and Alan Shearer did it. Alan Shearer should know better in his piece in, in The Athletic where he was defending Steve Bruce. He was talking about Miguel Almiron as a forward and as his you know, goal-scoring contribution, and that's not what he is. And do you guys not understand? Have you not went back and watched anything? Do you not understand what kind of a player he is? You've had him in training every day. You should know. If you're looking at him as a number nine, then yeah, you're going to be disappointed because he's not. He should be your player in the middle of the park that is your link. It's, just, it's, it's really, really bad. It's really, really bad. I'm sorry, Alex. I totally apologize. And no, we're not going Richard to. Richard Ransom wants to know when the Newcastle is going to re-sign Santiago Munoz to help them. They should. They should let him be the manager. Um, it's awful. It's just awful. It's not a talent thing to me. It's a coaching thing. Yeah. It's 100% right um, a coaching issue for me. So we'll see how that goes this weekend. We'll see how all the other games go this weekend. You've got games today. Uh, quick reminder, you've got a top-of-the-table clash in Germany at 2.30, uh, Union Berlin hosting Bayer Leverkusen. You've got the Rome Derby, Lazio hosting Roma at 2.45. You have a huge match in Portugal, Porto hosting Benfica at 4 o'clock. You've got Liga MX tonight. Not the biggest games that grab your attention. Nicoxa hosting Atletico San Luis and Juarez hosting Tijuana. Um, that's about it for today. And then we'll have the power hour tomorrow to get you ready for everything over the weekend. Lots of stuff. Uh, do not fire Steve Bruce and hire Big Sam Thomas to win. That is just oh. gross and disrespectful and mean. And um, oh. Alex Bassine should be very upset. We're going to go on that. Y'all have a good rest of the day. We'll be back for the power hour in the morning. Mucha plat, y'all. Mucha plat, y'all.